In this module, we will explore the levels of organization within the human body from the chemical and cellular level up to the whole organism. Once completed with this module, you should be able to discuss cellular composition at both the atomic level as well as at the chemical level. In subsequent modules, we will discuss the functioning of various organs and organ systems. In order to understand that physiology, it is important to grasp how various body parts and organs function at the cellular level, which requires us to back things up and begin a deeper exploration of how the bodies are built at a microscopic level. To begin, our bodies are made up of matter. Broadly defined, matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Matter has often been described as the stuff of our universe. Even the air we breathe, while invisible to the eye, is comprised of matter, and those molecules we breathe in have mass. Matter can exist in different states, such as a gas, liquid, or solid. While most people are familiar with those three states of matter, there are actually five states of matter, including the two additional states of plasma and Bose-Einstein condensates, which we did not even know about until created in a lab in 1995. Luckily for our study of the human body, focusing on gas, liquid, and solid states of matter will be more than ample to cover everything that applies to you as a future paramedic. When discussing these three primary states of matter that are very common here on the planet Earth, water is often used to illustrate the difference between these states. At normal room temperature, water is a liquid. When frozen, water is ice. When heated, water becomes vapor. With this description of matter in mind, the first level of organization in the human body is chemical in nature. This level deals with the basic and fundamental building blocks of all matter, atoms. All matter is made of atoms. We will explore just what makes an atom in a little bit. For the time being, just know that atoms are the building blocks of matter. Not all atoms are created the same, however, which serves as the basis of various elements, such as carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen. When two or more atoms are bonded together, they form a molecule. It is the combination of these various molecules that form our next level of organization recognized within the human body cells. While atoms are the building blocks of matter, cells are the building blocks of life. Cells provide structure for the body. They obtain nutrients from food, convert those nutrients into energy, and carry out specific functions within the body depending upon just what type of cells they are. Cells are also responsible for holding hereditary information and can make copies of themselves which is critical for reproduction. We will be discussing cellular structure and function in much greater depth in the next module. When specific cells with similar functions are joined together, they form tissues, the third level of organization in the body. These tissues perform specific functions within the body. As an example, this particular picture highlighted here is of cardiac muscle tissue. The job of these cells are to shorten and lengthen, contract and relax in unison to create the mechanical pumping force of the heart. These tissues then combine with others to create an organ that serves a specific function within the body. Therefore, organs are the next level of organization within the body. We just discussed cardiac muscle tissue, which is obviously a primary component of the heart. That cardiac muscle tissue is not the only tissue within the heart, however. Conductive tissue, necessary for the heart's electrical system, valves, blood vessels, and connective tissue all work along with the cardiac muscle tissue to form a fully functioning heart designed to pump blood throughout the body. When you begin to combine several organs to serve a specific function, you now have an organ system. The cardiovascular or circulatory system contains not only the heart, but a vast network of blood vessels designed to distribute blood and critical oxygen to the cells within the body. Lastly, when all organ systems are pulled together to form a living being, an organism is said to exist. This is the last level and highest level of organization for the human body, as the organism is indeed the whole of the human body built upon organ systems, their organs, the tissues that comprise those organs, the cells of those tissues, and the individual chemical atoms and molecules necessary to build cells and life. As we already introduced organs and organ systems in a previous module, let's take a closer look at the building blocks of those organs down to the atomic level. Again, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. 
While we said the building blocks of matter are atoms, atoms themselves are made up of even smaller particles. At the center of an atom is its nucleus, which is commonly comprised of positively charged protons and neutrons, which have no charge. I say commonly because there is one atom in particular that lacks a neutron, but more on that in a second. Orbiting or existing around this proton-neutron nucleus is a negatively charged electron. The mass of an atom comes predominantly from its neutrons and protons. The neutrons are slightly heavier than the protons, both of which are significantly heavier and larger than the electrons. Therefore, the mass of an atom is primarily that associated with its protons and neutrons. For what it's worth, these microscopic particles are subsequently built from even smaller particles known as quarks. The good news for us is that the proverbial rubber really hits the road with protons, neutrons, and electrons, so there is no need for us to worry about quarks and quantum mechanics. The number of protons in an atom determines just what kind of atom it is, or stated differently, what element that atom is. The simplest atom, hydrogen, contains one proton, no neutrons, and one electron. As you add protons to an atom, it becomes a different element. A carbon atom has six protons. An oxygen atom has eight protons. Adding or removing a neutron to an atom does not change the nature of the atom itself. It remains the same element as it was before. Rather, adding or removing that neutron makes the atom heavier or lighter, respectively, and creates what is known as an isotope of that atom. The same can be said for electrons in that the underlying type of atom, the element, does not change. Rather, adding or removing electrons forms ions of that element and also changes the underlying charge of that atom. Remember that protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. So long as the number of protons and electrons are the same, the atom has no electrical charge. Add an extra electron, however, and that ion now has a negative charge given one more electron than proton. Remove an electron, and the ion is positively charged given one more proton than electron. Ultimately, these different atoms are reflected in the periodic table of the elements. As you will see, life could not exist without many of these various elements. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are the primary elements within the human body accounting for approximately 96% of the person's mass. Additional elements within the human body include calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, chlorine, sodium, magnesium, chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, iodine, iron, manganese, and zinc. Inversely, some elements in certain quantities are actually really bad for living tissues and organisms. Where things become really interesting, however, is when these different atoms combine to form entirely new things. When two atoms join together, referred to as bonding, they form molecules, or compounds. Anytime you have two or more atoms bonding, a molecule is formed. Two oxygen atoms bonding will form an O2 molecule. Two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom forms a molecule of water, H2O. If the atoms that are bonding are different atoms, the molecule formed is referred to as a compound. This bonding occurs by the transfer or sharing of electrons from, to, or between atoms. Without delving too deep into high school chemistry, the electrons of any atom exist within different quantum states of probability associated with distinct energy levels. To make the discussion simpler, though, these states are often referred to as shells with subshells known as orbitals. Each orbital can contain a given number of electrons. As an orbital fills up with electrons, extra electrons then exist in the next highest orbital. At some point, all of the electrons are associated with various orbitals around the nucleus. Those electrons in the outermost orbital are referred to as valence electrons. If the outermost orbital is filled with all of the electrons it can handle, the atom is very happy and does not lend itself to bonding with other atoms. When that outermost orbital is not full, however, the atom is often very happy to receive electrons from or give electrons to another atom. When this occurs, a bond is formed. How a bond is formed can vary depending upon the underlying elements. 
The first type of chemical bond we need to explore is an ionic bond. An ionic bond is one that occurs between a nonmetal and a metal, where one atom gives up an electron to another atom so that each atom can have a complete valence orbital. Here is an example of a lithium atom giving an electron to a fluoride atom. When that occurs, the lithium ion loses an electron and becomes positively charged with a complete valence orbital containing two electrons, and the fluoride atom becomes a negatively charged ion given the addition of an electron that then fills its valence orbital with eight as opposed to the previous seven electrons. Ionically bonded molecules are solids at room temperature with high melting points. They are also soluble in water and, given the attraction of oppositely charged atom ions, it takes more energy to break an ionic bond than the next bond we will discuss, covalent bonds. A covalent bond is one between two nonmetal atoms, where the atoms actually share their valence electrons to achieve full valence orbitals. Here is an example of a covalent bond in action between one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Carbon has four valence electrons, yet its valence orbital can accommodate eight electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons and can have eight in its valence orbital. By sharing two electrons between these carbon and oxygen atoms, each atom believes it has a full valence orbital with eight electrons, even though two of those electrons in the oxygen atoms are from the carbon atom and four of the electrons in the carbon's valence orbital are from two separate oxygen atoms. Covalently bonded molecules tend to have lower melting and boiling points than ionically bonded molecules, which means these molecules can be gases, liquids, or solids at room temperature. Not all covalently bonded molecules do have a low melting point, however, depending upon the properties of that molecule. Diamonds provide an excellent example of covalently bonded carbon atoms that obviously have a very high melting point. Covalently bonded molecules are also less likely to dissolve in water and do not conduct electricity or heat well. Covalent bonds can also be qualified as single, double, or triple bonds where the atoms are sharing a single pair, two pairs, or even three pairs of electrons respectively. Not all covalent bonds are created equally in that some atoms have stronger electromagnetic forces that pull the electrons being shared closer to that atom's nucleus and further away from the bonded atom's nucleus. This creates what is known as a polar covalent bond where the molecule will have a slightly positively charged side and a slightly negatively charged side. A water molecule is a good example of a polar covalent bond where the oxygen atoms tend to pull the electrons closer to itself and further away from the hydrogen atoms, resulting in a slight negative charge on the oxygen side of the molecule and a slight positive charge on the hydrogen side of the molecule. When you have a molecule comprised of a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to a strongly electronegative atom, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, and that molecule is in the vicinity of another electronegative atom with a lone pair of electrons, those molecules may form a hydrogen bond. Again, water is an excellent example of hydrogen bonding in action. Because oxygen is highly electronegative, it withdraws most of the electron density in the covalent bond with hydrogen, leaving the hydrogen atom in a state that is almost like a bare proton, which has a positive charge. These positively charged hydrogens are then attracted to the nearby negatively charged oxygens. While hydrogen bonds are significantly weaker than ionic and covalent bonds, the hydrogen bonding in water is responsible for water being a liquid at room temperature as opposed to a gas, which is the state in which most molecular compounds with a similar mass to water are at room temperature. The unique structure of water molecules, in addition to hydrogen bonding, are also responsible for gaps between the molecules when water freezes, making ice less dense than liquid water, which is very different from most substances that become more dense when in a solid state. These hydrogen bonds are also very important in biology and the role they play in the physical structures of proteins and nucleic acids. Given this underlying knowledge of atoms and how they are bonded to form molecules and compounds, we can then begin exploring the way in which different molecules and compounds are combined or ripped apart in chemical reactions to form different substances.
As we will learn in a subsequent module, the cells of our body actually process numerous chemical compounds and elements through various chemical reactions to digest food, metabolize medications, form proteins, and so on. Having a cursory understanding of chemical reactions is important for the paramedic as those chemical reactions are necessary for the human organism to survive and an understanding of those reactions forms the basis for many of the interventions paramedics can take or administer to patients in crisis. The most common type of chemical reaction is one in which two or more chemical products are combined to form a single product. Called a synthesis or direct reaction, these types of chemical reactions are exothermic in that they release byproducts of heat and light. These synthesis reactions can occur between elements, like oxygen and hydrogen combining to form water, sodium and chloride combining to form salt, or carbon and oxygen combining to form carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. They can occur between compounds and elements, such as potassium chloride combining with oxygen to form potassium chlorate. Synthesis reactions can also occur between compounds, like sodium carbonate being formed by sodium oxide and carbon dioxide. If you have oxygen involved in an exothermic reaction that releases energy in the form of light and heat, a combustion reaction has occurred. Given the inclusion of oxygen in the discussion and the importance of oxygen in cellular metabolism, which will be discussed in another module, combustion reactions are very important in supporting life as we know it. A decomposition chemical reaction is essentially the opposite of a synthesis reaction. In a decomposition reaction, one reactant, compound, or product is converted into multiple products. Breaking down water into separate hydrogen and oxygen molecules is a decomposition reaction. Because this type of reaction actually breaks chemical bonds, energy is required. As a result, these reactions are endothermic. They absorb rather than produce energy. To assist with these types of reactions, a catalyst is often used to speed up the reaction. Catalysts lower the activation energy of chemical reactions without being consumed or used up themselves within the reaction. As far as the human body is concerned, enzymes facilitate most chemical reactions from the digestion of food and drug metabolism to the formation of proteins. The last type of common chemical reaction we need to cover is known as a replacement reaction. In such a reaction, two substances are decomposed and synthesized to produce different substances. There are actually two kinds of replacement reactions. A substitution, or a single replacement reaction, is one in which a single free element replaces or is substituted for one of the elements in a compound. Combining sodium with water, for example, yields sodium hydroxide and hydrogen. A metathesis, or double replacement reaction, is often thought of as a swapping of pairs or partners. Combining AB with CD yields AD and CB. An example would be calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid yielding calcium chloride and carbonic acid. With this background in mind, we can now explore some of the chemical compounds that are present, used, or created within the human body. The first are carbohydrates, also called saccharides, which are sugars, starches, and fibers often obtained from fruits, grains, vegetables, and milk products. Notice the construction of the word carbo or carbon followed by hydrates, which are compounds of hydrogen and oxygen. Carbohydrates are the body's main source of energy. Ironically enough, similar combinations of carbon and hydrogen without the oxygen are called hydrocarbons, which serve as fuel for many different types of mechanical processes such as gasoline within an internal combustion engine. Given the lack of oxygen inherently in hydrocarbons, oxygen is necessary to support combustion, which is where the hazardous materials technicians in the group start talking about lower and upper explosive limits and other related terms. While hydrocarbons are not designed for human consumption, carbohydrates are, and they are important as the body needs a lot of them, along with proteins and fats, to function, and we must consume those carbohydrates through the foods we eat as the body cannot create carbohydrates or proteins and fats on its own. Carbohydrates, along with proteins and fats, provide the calories our bodies need to produce energy. As far as carbohydrates are concerned, there are many types that can be used by the body. Simple sugars like glucose and fructose are monosaccharides. 
Double sugars, or sugars that are composed of two linked together monosaccharides like sucrose, are disaccharides. Simple sugars made up of three to up to ten monosaccharides are oligosaccharides, an example of which would be human milk oligosaccharides in breast milk. Such sugars are commonly indigestible and need to be broken down by colonic bacteria before they can be absorbed by the body. These oligosaccharides are also found on the plasma membrane of animal cells where they can play a role in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. If you have more than 10 monosaccharides joined together, you have another type of sugar. Polysaccharides are complex polyamic carbohydric structures formed by joining together either monosaccharides or disaccharides with glycosidic bonds. Starch, glycogen, and cellulose are examples of polysaccharides. Starch is broken down into glucose for energy. That which is not broken down is converted into glycogen and is stored within the liver and muscles to provide a source of energy when needed by the body. Cellulose is called a structural polysaccharide given that it is used in the cell walls of plants and other organisms. The human body lacks the enzymes necessary to break down cellulose, but even these polysaccharides serve a function as a source of fiber, which plays a role in numerous digestive processes within the body. Lipids are organic compounds that include a variety of hydrocarbon compounds that are non-soluble in water. Fats, waxes, oils, triglycerides, phospholipids, some vitamins, and steroids are all examples of lipids. Given the hydrocarbon structure of lipids, they can be an excellent source of energy when metabolized. Aside from the storage of energy as fat or triglycerides in the bloodstream, lipids are used to form structural components of cell membranes as phospholipids and also form various messenger and signaling molecules within the body as steroids, which includes cholesterol, cortisol, and cholic acid. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. Amino acids are organic compounds of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen bonded with other compounds. Essentially, a central carbon atom is bonded with a hydrogen atom, an amine group consisting of one nitrogen and two hydrogens, a carboxyl group of one carbon, two oxygens, and one hydrogen, and some other compound known as a R group. When amino acids bond between themselves, it is through what is known as a peptide or amide bond between the carboxyl group and one amino acid and the amino group of another which releases a water molecule in the process in what is known as dehydration synthesis or a condensation reaction, where water is removed from a compound to form something new. As amino acids are joined by peptide bonds, they form a chain known as a polypeptide or polypeptide chain. As these polypeptide chains increase in length to include 50 or more bonded amino acids, the structure is then called a protein. There are 20 amino acids in the human body that make up proteins within the human body. The human body can produce only 11 of these acids. The remaining 9 must be acquired through food consumption, eating. The amino acids we must acquire through food are referred to as essential amino acids, and they are essential for some critical bodily functions such as muscle growth and regeneration, energy production, fat metabolism, immune function, regulating appetite, regulating blood sugar levels, stimulating wound healing, hemoglobin production, and maintaining the myelin sheath barrier that surrounds nerve cells, to just name a few. The proteins built by amino acids are important to the body as they are building blocks for muscles, bones, cartilage, skin, blood, enzymes, hormones, antibodies, and other body chemicals. Proteins are responsible for doing most of the work that occurs in cells. They are necessary to maintain the structure of cells and are integral in the function and regulation of body tissues, such as maintaining or increasing muscle mass. Unlike carbohydrates and fat, the body does not store protein. We already mentioned enzymes earlier in this module, but they bear to be repeated here as enzymes are proteins that serve as a catalyst for biochemical reactions. Enzymes lower the activation energy of biochemical reactions within the body, which means it takes less energy to break or form bonds between different molecules and biochemical compounds. The way this works is by an enzyme binding to one or more reactant molecules. The area in which this happens is referred to as the active site, 
where the catalytic action occurs. The active site obtains its properties from the amino acids of which it is built. This gives the active site a very specific size, shape, and chemical behavior that binds to a specific target chemical compound. Nucleic acids are also critical to cellular composition as their main role is to store the information used by the body to make proteins through a process known as protein synthesis. Nucleic acids are made from nucleotides, which are built from a nitrogen-containing unit, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or uracil, a sugar molecule, and a phosphate compound. There are two main categories of nucleic acid. Deoxoribonucleic acid, DNA, which stores and transfers genetic information within living creatures, and ribonucleic acid, RNA, which acts as a messenger between DNA and ribosomes to make proteins. Another nucleotide, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is of critical importance as this nucleotide is often referred to as the energy currency of cells because ATP has the ability to store and transport chemical energy within cells. Without ATP, our bodies would not be able to synthesize DNA and RNA, produce essential proteins, or generate nerve impulses in the brain, to name just a few examples of just how important ATP is. You know how important gasoline is for a car as its fuel? You can think of ATP as the fuel of cells without which those cells would not be able to perform work. As we begin to wrap up this overview of chemical cellular composition, there are a few other chemicals and compounds we must recognize, namely vitamins and minerals or trace elements. Vitamins and minerals are nutrients that the body needs to stay healthy. They are raw materials that support numerous biological functions such as growing bone or producing hormones. Vitamins are organic compounds that are typically not produced by the body or are not produced in adequate quantities. Luckily, the body does not need many of them, which is why they are called micronutrients. Because the body does not make any or enough of the vitamins it needs to stay healthy, eating a proper and well-balanced diet is essential to ensure the body has the right amounts of 13 various vitamins necessary to maintain the overall health of the person. Not having enough of certain vitamins will result in diseases that could include scurvy, blindness, rickets, or others depending on the specific vitamin deficiency. Minerals are also necessary for the body to grow and stay healthy. Unlike vitamins, some minerals require larger amounts to stay healthy. These would include calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium, potassium, chloride, and sulfur. Those minerals we need in only small quantities are called trace minerals and include iron, manganese, copper, iodine, zinc, cobalt, fluoride, and selenium. To understand why minerals are important, here are a few examples of what they do for us. Iron is necessary for the formation of hemoglobin, which transports oxygen around the body. Zinc helps the immune system and cellular growth, and calcium is a necessary component for strong bones and teeth. Believe it or not, it is possible to have too much of a good thing, however, as too much of any one mineral can be a problem. Sodium is an excellent example as too much sodium is associated with health problems like hypertension. The last chemical compound to be mentioned here is water. As critical and vital as water is to the human body, it does not produce its own water. People must drink water in adequate quantities on a consistent basis to ensure the body has enough water to carry nutrients and oxygen, remove cellular waste products, regulate body temperature, and feed muscles and skin. Believe it or not, many of the topics we discussed in this module will be explored further in even greater depth in subsequent modules. This was just an introduction. For the time being, however, you at least have an overview of the levels of organization within the human body and should be able to discuss cellular composition at both the atomic and chemical levels. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution non-commercial share-alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.